I don't know where to start. Friday the 16th of June 2023 will stay in my memory for a long time. The announcement that Gino made and lost his final battle went right through me. Such a young, talented, happy guy taken away from his way too soon. He will always be remembered as a guy who was ready to take a step to the top, a human with an eye for the future and someone who fought for climate change. As a child, I had the chance to see glaciers, Gino said, the everlasting ice, the face of the Alps, but there is nothing eternal about it. Worldwide, we lose 300 billion tons of ice per year. I hope that the future generations can enjoy that glaciers too. I will donate one Swiss franc in every race in 2022 for the climate change fight. Gino wasn't just a cyclist. He cared about the environment. He cared about people. With several projects to raise money to save the nature. Let that be an everlasting thought which always allows us to keep honoring Mader. Rest in peace, Gino. You will be missed. The past week has been extremely hard for everyone with a heart full of love for cycling. Gino Meder left on his final trip, which reminded us once again of the fact that cycling is just a side issue in life. Besides Tour de Suisse, there was a racing in Balois Belgium Tour and Tour of Slovenia. The Tour de France preparation races are done and dusted, so it's time to discuss who is and who isn't ready for La Grande Boucle. The last episode with three, domestique, uh, with three domestiques by my side seems a long time ago, but the wait is over. Eve is back after a week of rest, Bram is there again, and between the studying, Dieter found some time to join us as well. Welcome guys. Hey. Eve, uh, we already talked about it, but can you describe how difficult the past week has been for every fan of cycling? Um... I think it's very difficult to describe it with words. Um, we saw um, the information that Gino crashed in that descent, um, and we all knew at that point that it was bad. And um, there wasn't a lot of communication about it. And the day after, around noon, the news came that he passed away. Uh, yeah, and the world stopped for a moment. And yeah, yeah, cycling was really a yeah a side issue, and it actually talking about it right now, it still feels that way. It's a weird start of this episode. Yeah, it's. I said before recording, this will be probably the strangest and weirdest podcast we will record. I hope that it's. Not that will not happen a lot, but yeah, strange day, strange couple of days. Unfortunately, or yeah, it's maybe weird to say, but life still goes on. So there were other races, there were other activities also for us. Um, Bram, last Saturday was quite a special day for Domestique, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, all four of us got to meet each other for the first time face to face. Uh, of course, Eve and Hannes have met each other, uh, but for the rest of us, it, it was the first time meeting each other at the Wheeler Oracle quiz. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks to those guys for having us over. Um, we really enjoyed ourselves. Uh, I think we, we finished 15th out of 27. Um, so I, I think we can be proud of ourselves as well. Uh, our goal was not to be in the, in the bottom 10. So <laughs> we just nailed that. Uh, so mission accomplished. Now we have a goal for next year. Yeah, top 10 for sure. <laughs> All right, uh, Dieter, your exams are almost over, finally. How difficult was it to combine yeah, studying with the, watching the races? It's uh, good to uh, to get the might free a bit. So it was a good combination, in my opinion. Let's get started with the Tour de Suisse uh, review. It's uh, the most difficult one, obviously. Um, but the past week in Switzerland, the youth really showed themselves. We had uh, Juan Ayuso, Matthias Kielmose, um, Eutebrooks was there as well. Um, who surprised you the most of the youngsters? For me, it was probably uh, 
skill mode. Like we knew that he could win races, but uh, winning at this level against uh, an Avon Pool and an Ayuso is. I didn't expect him to to be able to do that. Uh, it definitely shows that he is uh, definitely a quality rider. Um, and yeah, the, the fact that Avon Pool was the the oldest person on the GC podium at Swiss is mind blowing. Um, Scale Mose did an uh, altitude camp before Tour de Suisse, so he was really targeting that race. But what can we expect from him um, having our eyes at Tour de France? I think we could expect him in the top 10, to be honest. Um, in Paris, GC? Yeah, I think so. Um, looking at the, the Trek team, uh, you, you have most likely a Chicone who's going to target the, the KOM jersey. Uh, and Skielmos is going to be in a protected role. So he has said that he's probably going to be targeting a GC and that a top 10 should be possible. So I don't see why not. Uh, Dieter, um, I recall we had a conversation back in the McDonald's uh, about Skielmos. Um You said to- top 10 GC, that's not possible. I think um, like low top 10, that's the other limit like he, sh- he shouldn't yet and go for that in my opinion it's a fun tour for attacking but maybe he uh, if I was him I would try like the first week uh, see how GC goes maybe it goes very well and above all expectations you can go further with GC and if not you can go for stage wins with Chicone but actually um I think most people were most surprised in the uh, mountain top finish that Skelmos won in the uh, one in the in the tools first, but the most surprising thing to me was his uh, TT on the last stage against uh, Ayuso, very good time trialist. Remco, <laughs> obviously a very good uh, time trialist too. To be that close, like the first checkpoint, I thought it's it's over, is GC is done, and he closed I think 16 seconds back on those two. Guys, that's that's the most surprising part to me. If you wanted to add something to that, I have to agree with Ditter on this one. I I would like to see Skelmos more like a stage hunter and not aiming for a general classification because like finishing tenth or ninth in a Tour de France is quite nice. But I don't want to see Skelmos uh, like what Polis did last year. Um, Polis try to stick with the GC group as well as long as possible to get that 10th place if I recall correctly but Skelmo is too young and too attractive to just stick his yeah, stick to the GC group and it's his first Grand Tour if I recall correctly so just uh, get some experience and get that stage win under the belt so you'd prefer a little trek without GC guy? With the Gigone, uh, Moloma probably? Pure stage hunting. Yeah, they can make, they can make it to the France very attractive with Pedersen as well. They can sure. make the the sprint stages with a more hilly terrain harder to drop a Jakobsen, for example. Um, so they can make it to the France a lot more interesting if they go rock and just attack or do things different than the Propolitan is used to. Another protagonist of uh, Tour de Suisse was Juan Ayuso. And I remember us having a chat in yeah, in, in the conversation that he, he was riding weird. Uh, it was a weird week for him, dropping in the early stages. Then he was getting better and better. What is our conclusion about uh, Ayuso? We can't forget he had a serious injury um, at the beginning of the year. Um, so his base condition, his the foundations weren't perfect, uh, in my opinion. And you saw that in Tour de Suisse, he had a good stage mixed with a quite a bad stage where he was saved by Hirschi to then the stage afterwards just demolish the opposition. That shows he has a lot of quality and is a 
top tier rider, but there you saw he misses that base fitness level that you need to perform high for a longer period of time. So we still see him as the top favorite for La Vuelta. Interesting. Um, Uitebroeks, does he get the attention he deserves here in Belgium? I think it's good that he doesn't because that's something that we've always had with, with Remco. Having so much pressure and attention on him isn't a good thing for a young rider. Uitebroeks actually living a little bit in the shadow of Remco and, and honestly, I think he's grateful for that um, because otherwise the, the Belgian press would be on him the whole time. Uh, now he gets to grow, try stuff out, uh, sort of in the in the calm of the, the press. Yeah, as you say, he's really in the shadows. Um, he had three top 10 GCs uh, on World Tour level, if I recall correctly, which is quite impressive. And still no one is really talking about him. Um, you say that's an advantage, but isn't that a little bit of disrespect? I mean, when we say that nobody's talking about him, I don't think that's true. The, the people who care a lot about cycling definitely know he's there and they're very excited about him. He's 20 years old, doing these top 10s. Um, from the moment he starts winning, I think it's going to explode. Uh, right now, uh, looking at top 10s, a lot of the, the, the cycling press doesn't look at it that much more failures, perhaps. Um but from when he starts winning these GCs or winning stages, we're going to get a very different type of coverage around him. I think according to uh, Pro Cycling Stats, he's also going to La Vuelta. Mm -hmm. That's correct. What do you advise it's him? Normal, the normal young rider. I think you should expect less uh, from a young rider in the in the Grand Tour in comparison to a one-week race. But Kian is like the type that doesn't doesn't die in a, in a tough race. Also, the best stages for him are like those tough stages with uh, four uh, long hills, not uh, one explosive last hill. So I think he will do better in the Vuelta as what we have seen in one-week races from him. I think he'll do really good in the Vuelta. And what should he do? Uh, target GC, uh, beat Domestique? Or pick some stages. He already said that he wanted to target GC. And I also think why not. Like he's not that explosive type that Skialmos is. He's a pure, pure climber. So and if GC doesn't work out. Like I said with Skialmos. Like try the first week. If you, if you're like uh, it's um, 15th place. Yeah. Draw back and go for stages. But I don't think that will be the case. Uh, with Kion. So you think top 10, top 10 should be within reach? I think that it's top 5 even is... Top 5? Damn, is, Peter. Is, yeah, I really expect a lot from Kion. Apparently. <laughs> Eve, Bram? Top 5? Top 10? Top 15? A lot will depend, first of all, which role he gets in the team. Is there a leader who's performing better and who has a higher status within the team? He probably will get a free role in some stages. But, yeah, a top five, I don't know if that's possible. He has the talent. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm, agree yeah. I'm agreeing with that, but it's his first Grand Tour. So far, I had the feeling that if there was another leader uh, at Bora in the one-week races he did now, yeah, he he didn't do worse than the leader. Mm, I think... I think it was only Schachmann now mm -hmm. in the Swiss. Um, if you put a, a top, in top shape Vlasov or a Hindley there, that guys are a little bit higher in the order of the team. And then Eute Brooks might get the free roll. I wouldn't give him the full domestic duty. But there will be there might be a big leader in the Bora squad and he might be in the shadow of that rider. One of the big surprises of the week, 
at least for me, was uh, Felix Gull, who wore the leader's jersey uh, for a few days, I think. Um, was it a surprise to you guys as well? For me, it was. <laughs> I don't know, Dieter, as, as the data analyst, maybe the guy, he sees some things we don't see. With, with Gull, I didn't see it coming, to be honest. Like, uh, he got beaten by a not that good Carapaz in the yeah, in the French one day race with the with with the with the hard name. Uh it was was a decent level but not like be leader in a world tour stage race level. So I didn't expect that but he he uh, made another step. Uh but in the future for G C should definitely uh improve his T T because it's just just horrible. He has he has the legs, he has the watts and just purely the position and the bike. So yeah. Yeah. How many minutes did he lose in the final time trial in Swiss? Three, I think. A little more three, than three. Three minutes, yeah, that, that's a lot, of course. Um, now he's going to Tour de France with Ben O'Connor. Um, yeah, Yves, go ahead. I don't know if I completely agree with Dieter. Um, he has the watts and his positioning is terrible on a TT bike. But can you lose three minutes with a terrible... TT bike and position three minutes is a, three minutes is a lot and there was a climb in it as well. So imagine okay. a pan imagine a pan flat time trial from forty kilometers and the guy is out of time. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's fucked. <laughs> like but this position, Bram also said it in our uh, Discord on the flat. A lot of times he he had like the the drops. He wasn't the drops of the of the time trial bike, not in position. With, with with 50 kilometers an hour on the flat that does so much like yeah it, it's really a purely the t position yeah i agree but there are riders who can't get the same power output in the time trial position in comparison to their normal position like you can push 350 watts on the road bike but that's not that easy to push that amount of watts in a tt position yeah but you um not everyone um, can or should get the position that Juan Ayuso or Remco Evenepoel has, but there's a there's a very big gap between Felix Gull's position and uh, Remco Evenepoel's position, and also like without um, sitting any deeper, just like he had, he has his hands here and his head here, just bring those hands to his head without going any deeper. And that's already like a minute he makes up in the in the stage, literally. It's so easy. We're talking about TT positions now. A little bit uh, a side note. Who sits better on a TT bike? Remco Evenepoel or Marlen Reusser? Mm -hmm. That's a tricky one. Marlen, Marlen Reusser also has great position. And she's she's taller than Remco, so it's harder to get in that position. So it, that also makes it a hard comparison. Let's say they are be both beautiful positions. <laughs> I think that's a very uh, good answer. Um, it's all it's always interesting to think about the role of a rider going to a Grand Tour. Um, that's also the case for Felix Gall. Would you bring him as a protected rider or as the super domestique of Ben O'Connor at the Age de Zer Citroën team? Uh, I would bring him as a stage hunter, a pure stage hunter. Because what he did this week uh, in that climb where they did an amazing raid on that final climb going at like 22 kilometers to go. And I think there was a satellite rider uh, up the road as well. Um, that was beautiful cycling. And, and as well, uh, Gull holding a minute over a chasing GC groups where like Remco is getting dropped a couple of times as well. Uh, and a lot of others were in difficulty. Uh, Ayuso got dropped as well so staying a minute in front of that is just wow uh, I was I was very impressed with that performance so scale Mose stage hunting Gaul stage hunting at Tour de France isn't Gaul a polka dot jersey guy no that's for Ciccone different team though Gaul could go against Ciccone like when we saw how Gull is climbing at this moment. He can compete on every climb in the third week with Shikone. And he mentioned he has the legs of his life. 
I don't know if that will be still possible in three or four weeks when the tour starts, of course, maybe speaking too soon. Um, but he might target yeah, that mountain. Dieter, you were going to say something? There would be a, a classical to peak in the in the preparation race to then be uh, behind your top shape in the in the big race. Yeah. A classic French team member, if I recall correctly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um back to Gino Meder and uh, Remco Evenepoel's stage win. Although it wasn't really a win, um, the stage, yeah, how do we say that? The time was was taken at 25 kilometers uh, from the finish. And then the riders who wanted to race uh, got to race. And I think Wout van Aert was the first one to pick up the pace. And then Remco Evenepoel attacked and finished a solo of 15 kilometers, 15.20. And how beautiful is it to see the world champion doing such things or is it too symbolic first of all i would like to mention and i don't understand it at all the criticism that Rampo ramco received once again after he did that it's like even if does always something wrong for a lot of cycling fans but this was his way to honor gino made it in the rainbow jersey solo so for all the critics, sorry, but I don't understand it at all. I mean, it was a beautiful moment. Is there any other rider who can use his emotions that hard as Remco Evenepoel in a race? Michael Ventura is not a road cyclist, but I remember one time his uncle died, I think. And he, if, if I recall correctly, he won. It was a muddy race. Don't know which one. But it was a flat race, not even suiting him. And he beats Van der Poel and Van Aert purely on, on the power to honor his Winkel. But like, yeah, Remco also has that, that power. He did it for Bjorg. He did it for Stef. I yeah. think he did it for Fabio Beautiful. as well in Poland. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. So that's like the fourth, yeah, sadly, already the fourth time though. But it's always beautiful. Exactly. There are riders who get strength uh, because of such events. And then you have uh, in Slovenia, um, a pillow who attacked uphill, but exploded quite fast. But he just wanted to honor Meder as well and get that attack in. So there are riders who find strength out of it and there are riders who just don't want to hop back on that bike and just go home. Wout van Aert was in the peloton as well uh, this week. Tour de Suisse was his final preparation race on Tour de France. How do we rate his week of racing? Uh, I think he said himself that he's not happy with it. Uh, he expected more from this week. Um, that being said, this is a, a difficult week to really make judgments on, uh, on on how good someone is, especially after uh, Mather's accident. Um, there were definitely some some opportunities for uh, Van Aert there, but I think he wasn't his at his full strength. He still has the the Belgian championships sort of you know, get to a, a higher shape as well but he's also not targeting the first week of the, the tour as he was last year uh, his goals are a bit uh, later in the month of July I think it's fair to say yeah. he still needs some a few percentages to get on, on his top shape um, he was in the breakaway I think in the meter stage um, in, in, the, in the mountains and I had a good feeling about him that day but you're right, um, he's not the best fan art we've already seen uh, last year, for example. So there's still some time and, and room to improve, uh, I think. Yeah, but it's also for the better. Like uh, last year, for example, he was on his knees. At the end of the tour, he uh, had to skip San Sebastian. But this year, you have the, the Worlds uh, two weeks after uh, the road race, two weeks after the tour and the TT. Uh, only a week after 
if I re uh, recall correctly. So you can't be dead at the end of the tour. You need to be you need to get that exact right amount of work in to get that super compensation. Yeah, he's focus focusing on other targets in comparison to last year. Now he wants to come out of the tour quite fresh to be able to compete for the Rainbow jersey. So he might peak in the Tour de France at the the end of the second week, third week, to be able to keep that peak up till the Worlds. And still um, his wife, girlfriend, uh, is pregnant as well. So that's something where his mind is as well. There is a child coming and yeah, getting a child is more important than a race. He said it himself. He's going to withdraw the tour if that child is coming. Will it have an impact on the world? We don't know. It will depend when that child is coming, but that child is a priority. I saw some questions on Twitter as well about uh, yeah, the fact that Wout van Aert isn't targeting the green jersey. Uh, a lot of people thought that was because of um, the birth of his... Uh, of his second child. But the main reason is the fact that he wants to go for the world, right? He said it himself that going for the green jersey, um, it asks a lot of effort. At the intermediate sprints, uh, for example, you need to be there every single day and he doesn't want to have that empty feeling uh, in the third week, which perfectly makes uh, sense in my opinion. To um, fair, I think I still think he can win the green jersey without really having to sprint for all those intermediates. Um, he said he wants to go for more stages. How do you get the most points for the green jersey? Winning a lot of stages. Uh, I don't think he needs to go for the intermediates to necessarily win that classification. Dieter? Yeah, I, agree. I agree with that. Uh, with Bram, uh, by the way, but um, knowing Jumbo, I think um, Wout will even, depending on the, how much energy you already spent uh, in stages before, like in the last week, like, ah, we tour was hard enough, uh, take it easy, uh, only help uh, Jonas when, he, when you need to, or like, if they think that ah, tour wasn't hard enough, go, go in the break today, get more cages in to really, I think, Van Aert is really in the the World Championships this year are really very important for him. So I think like he will ride a very measured Tour de France and spend as little energy as possible and only when he needs to. Um, one last rider we need to talk about uh, at Tour de Suisse is a uh, Thomas Pitcock. You guys talked about my. Yeah, hot take. Uh, last week I said he could be, um, yeah, not the leading man, but the best man in GC after three weeks of Tour de France for Ineos Gren Grenadiers. Um, he ended up 22nd in GC, so this wasn't really the perfect week for him. Um, does it change anything about the way he's going to Tour de France, you think? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> this is with Pitcock, you never really know what you're going to get. I've been saying that all along. Um, I don't think we're going to see a, a GC Pitcock anytime soon. Um, also based on this, uh, performance, uh, a stage hunting Pitcock. Yeah. Uh, we saw that last year with the, the Alpe d'Huez stage. When he's on something in a day, he's on a level, um, but he doesn't really seem to have it in him to be consistent even during a single stage race. He's targeting uh, the yellow jersey, the first yellow jersey at Tour de France. Um, Dieter, do you think that's possible? Yeah, I think that's possible. Like he has those two kilometers, 10 percent. If you take 20 kilometers average, it's a six, a six minute climb. That's definitely it what Pitcock can do, but as Bram says, I, um, it's, Pitcock isn't going to be a, a Grand Tour rider anytime soon, and I think never, to be honest. I like, he can do almost everything, but I don't think he has that fatigue resistance and also not the mental resistance for three weeks. He has a lot of troubles from, um, like, I, I can't go over the name, like, after he won 
uh, Olympics uh, decompression, like to have to go full for two weeks. Uh, you need to be in. You need to have great fatigue resistance, but also mentally, you need to be on it every day, and that just seems like a thing that doesn't suit Pitcock, which also really isn't the problem. Like last year, yeah, the yeah the great tour, you don't need to win Grand Tours to be a, a successful rider. That's it for Tour de Suisse. Uh, let's move over to Balwaza Belgium Tour. Um, yeah, which was as expected in the big uh, Mathieu van der Poel show. Um, and immediately I see a smile on my screen, uh, of course. Um, Yves, uh, talk us through the week of Mathieu van der Poel in Belgium. Well, it was a classic Mathieu van der Poel one-week stage race. He didn't give a damn about saving energy. He went full gas in the full state in first first stage, attacking multiple times and then doing a mega lead out for Philipson. Um before yeah, destroying the field in the Queen stage uh, in the debris, uh, leaving the others behind with a little bit over thirty Ks to go if I recall correctly. On a very tough circuit, it goes up and down all the time. Uh, around the debris. Um, yeah, it was very nice to see him perform on that level and it shows he's ready for the Tour de France. Uh, Rothoff himself said he, Mathieu, trained very well um, in the training camp before the Balwaza Belgium Tour. So he's ready for uh, a full Tour de France, still Paris, with some Mathieu van der Poel shows in it. Um, Mathieu said it himself that the debris stage were probably his best data on the bike uh, in his career, <laughs> which is pretty impressive knowing what the guy already did uh, in the past years. Dieter, you as the data analyst, what's your opinion uh, on that? Do you believe that? I have a hard time believing it. I think like at, at the time he also didn't do it to analyze yet like no disrespect to the field in Balwaza but it wasn't the top top field like if you Vajek came he blew up eventually but he came a lot closer I think uh, Meizenko finished on 30 seconds uh, if you see what Van der Poel already did in Strade Bianchi or in the Ronde van Vlaanderen, those numbers just can't be at the same level or even at a higher level as those performances. Um, not only Van der Poel was in a great shape, his teammate Jasper Philipsen was as well. Um, he won a stage. But so did Fabio Jakobsen, his big opponent, I think, for uh, the sprints in Tour de France. What are our conclusions um, about Philipsen against Jakobsen going to that tour? I think beforehand we would have said that Philipsen was definitely going to be stronger. Uh, I think this week Philipsen won two stages or one stage? I think two. I thought uh, one. Only one? Okay. Uh uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Jakobsen too. Uh, that's what I meant. Uh, I think Jakobsen has shown that he's probably the right pick for the tour. Uh, if he's able to beat Philipsen twice uh, in a week, um, of course there are certain circumstances. I think the in the one uh, there was a big crash. Um, the first one, uh, Jakobsen won. Um, Philipsen crashed with the uh, Ewan. Yeah, um, the last one was a lot cleaner. Um, so yeah, I think. Jakobsen is ready for a tour, but Philipsen is is equally ready, and we're going to have some some good sprint duels with some other guys there as well. Jakobsen Fabio said didn't... today in a newspaper he would like to take his sprint train he had in Balwaza Belgium tour to the Tour de France. Um, so that train is Lampard, Kasper Pedersen, and uh, Morkov. Compare it to Van der Poel, Ricard, and Sinkeldam. In your opinion, which is the best train? Jakobsen's. Intrinsically, Jakobsen's, but in the, the previous part of the year, we definitely saw issues with Jakobsen not wanting to follow Marco as much as he used, or as much as he should. Uh, didn't trust him as much, but this week, 
we saw pretty decent trust between the two and uh, it starts to work out. In my opinion, um, the quick step train is the most experienced one. But I think the the train of Alpecin really has the potential to be the best. Especially when, when Van der Poel is in there. Of course, you, you have the risk Van der Poel, he cuts off the legs of Philipsen. Uh, going in too hard as the lead out. Um, but if Van der Poel, Ricard and Sinkeldam are on their best level, making the right choices, I don't think there's a better train. It's just a very different type of lead-out train with uh, Van der Poel coming in as the last guy. Very powerful, very different to Mirko, who is able to just position himself very cleverly and, and do his effort in a very smart way, where Matteo is just pure power. Um, seeing those two trains go head-to-head has -head been super interesting this week. And um, Personally, I still prefer Mirko's uh, way of doing it, but you can't deny that uh, Matteo's way is... a uh, Amazing to look at. Another interesting sprinting duo is um, the duo of Uno X with the Sören Wedenskjöld and Alexander Kristoff. Um, I have the feeling sometimes they're sprinting next to each other instead of helping each other, uh, finishing fourth and fifth, five and sixth. Um, what should be the plan going to the Tour de France? Is is Wedenskjöld the better sprinter than Alexander Kristoff, or do we still trust the experience of of Good old Alexander. Sort of depends on their goal. Is it their goal to... Well, do you think they can actually win a stage? I personally don't. So they can actually do get a lot of UCI points there, which is important for a team like UNOX uh, if they want to promote to the World Tour. And this is a huge opportunity for them to get a whole lot of points. So actually stacking them into the top five is not a bad plan. Dieter, I see you're doubting. Yeah, like uh, a sprint stage win, you can get uh, like sometimes uh, a sprint stage win, like almost the present if you are good positioned. And yeah, uh, Wereldspeld is just, I don't know, and like I didn't look. Um, very good at the sprint stages yet for the tour but if, if there's like a false flat um uphill sprint i i wouldn't want to sprint against the world skill it's just like such such a strong yeah he doesn't die he's like christoph it's like a type of christoph rider but better in my opinion um there's one more name we need to talk about here. Um, Thibaut Nace, who's He finished second in the V, I think. And the guy said, I really had the legs to win. Which would be really impressive, uh, knowing what Van der Poel did. But still, uh, second in the V, third in, uh, in Brussels in the final stage. This has been, yeah, a really strong week for little Nace. That was bit... Quite a bad first stage, or bad. That's quite harsh, but he exploded quite early on in that first stage where Alpicin made the race very hard. And at that point, I had the feeling, ooh, that's very early. But he proved me wrong in the Dupuis stage and the sprint to uh, in Brussels. So... He's very strong, he's still young, and it is quite impressive to see. I think Steven did the lead out on Sunday for him. That he has already a good status within Trek Sea Alfredo, little track in a couple of weeks. Let's move over to Tour of Slovenia, where we saw um, a few shows as well. For example, Matej Mohoric, um, yeah, the teammate of, of Gino Meder. He really put on a show in the final stage, it was, I think. Dieter, you did a small analysis of his performance. What were your conclusions? Uh, 7.8 watts per kilo for the full, uh, for the full climb uh, for the half minutes and 8.2 for the last three minutes. That's, that's a really high level. That's, that's Van Aert van der Poel. To like those uh, 
it's five minute guys uh, level that's like um, it's very steep and he followed uh, Zana who is in excellent shape and a lot uh, uh, less heavy on those steep gradients that's that says no and that then he he brought it home uh, for Gino yeah, just amazing to see the guy is ready for Tour de France yeah as well um, last year he was about the same level in, in Slovenia but his Tour de France was I, I can't remember I I have a, uh, I think something went wrong before the Tour that he got sick or something but I can't remember it anymore so like it's uh, but normally with this with this shape and these numbers you are going to do very well in the tour mm. someone else who might be ready but I don't know if he's going is, is Edith Schelling the Dutch guy finished three times inside the top 10 um, I find it difficult to yeah to know what his possibilities would be going to the Tour de France Um, he's currently not scheduled for it, um, but he's like one of those writers that is super versatile as well, very modern type of writer, uh, as opposed to the very specialized type. Um, I think if he would go, uh, he'd be able to win a couple of stages, but I think we'll see him at La Vuelta uh, if he doesn't go to the Tour, uh, because he is an amazing, like he's turned into a, a great stage hunter. Uh, where opposed, like in the olden days, he was more of a a breakaway rider, really good at it. Uh, but now he's just winning sprints. It, it's great. Someone else who won sprints in uh, Slovenia was Dylan Grunewegen. Um, Philipsen won, Jakobsen won, Ewan didn't, Grunewegen did. Is he on the same level as Jakobsen and Philipsen for he's you? He still is one of the fastest guys out there, I think. He, he needs a uh... We saw it last year in the tour. Uh, he did a very, very flat and easy stage uh, with as less um, uh, cages as possible uh, in the legs. Um, he doesn't want to to spend energy because that, yeah, then his sprint just dies off. Um, but pure speed, he's he's at the same level. He already, I don't, I, yeah, I don't like him as. As a as a young, but as a sprinter, he's he's an amazing sprinter. If uh, something tells me you don't agree with that, uh, in my opinion, Philipsen is the fastest together with Jakobsen, and then Grunewegen and Ewan are a little step lower, certainly at Tour de France, where there aren't a lot of pure sprint straight stages. Uh, Rune Wien will have a lot of trouble to be able to hold on to the peloton in a couple of sprint stages as they are mentioned by uh, the two fronts. So um, I don't really believe in the Dutchman and I don't really believe he's gonna, he's gonna reach Paris as it's quite hard and I know a lot of not a lot of sprinters get OTL'd the last couple of years but Rune Wien is a really bad climber in terms of pro cyclists of course he's probably gonna yeah beat the everything out of me uphill but amongst pro cyclists he's one of the worst climbers but last year was all right we've last year was a worse tour for sprinters i think to be, uh, get out with the l and he also finished that one so i think it's also a bit overrated how bad of a climber Groenewegen is it's not that bad as some say I think but he doesn't get over uh, yeah it's a Dutch word but a more hope is too steep for him so he still finished last year's tour though and that was hard All right guys uh, we've reviewed the three preparation races uh, on Tour de France I saw one of our Twitter subscribers asked us if we had a dark horse for the tour. Is there a name popping up in your minds? I already told you mine uh, last Saturday. 
can we qualify Torsten Trein um, as a dark horse? Yes. That is a dark horse for sure. Um, are we talking GC here or like points for uh, like betting? Yeah, I just um, saw dark horse, so it, I think it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm very curious what Fred Wright is going to be up to this year. Um, after a pretty amazing couple of, of uh, Grand Tours last year with the Tour and the Vuelta. Uh, but a very disappointing classic season this year, or at least I thought it was disappointing. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious where he's at. I haven't really seen much of him in the past couple months. Um, I don't know. I, I think he could be one of those people that could be really surprising. I don't know how much he's at, uh, if like Willard Manager or whatever, or Scurido. Yves Dieter, I guess you're researching a name. <laughs> Give me a minute. Did it? It's up to you now. Yeah. That was a bullseye. Ouch. Um, hmm. I have the. Uh, if uh, my. Very interesting part of the podcast. My, my good friend Jordi Meus is yeah, it, still it, on the long list for Bora, but I sadly think they are going to take Sam Bennett, who is slower than Jordi Meus. But yeah. Uh, but if they take Meus to the tour. I think he's the most underrated sprinter out there. He always got the shit train from Bora, while Bennett got the got the amazing train with with <laughs> Merlin uh, on Popo. Yeah, you know the train, amazing train from Bora. But Joni Meus never got that train uh, in a race. If you put Meus behind that train and you go to the tour, you have a stage win. Anyway, um, next week there's our Tour de France preview when we know a little more about the teams. So maybe that's the better time to give some dark horses unless if you you give me a name right now. Well, I have a name, but I'm not so sure he's starting. Um, my name is Matteo Sobrero. Um, as an Italian, he didn't write the Giro and he performed quite well in the two time trials in, uh, in Swiss. So he's ready. He was twice eight in that time trials. And if he's speaking well, he can surprise in a certain stage. But Dieter is saying I'm wrong, but yeah, I don't care. <laughs> no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong. This was just not the level of Soprero in Swiss. His, his level is, he has the potential to do much better than two eight places in the in ATT in Swiss, but it's Definitely a good name as a dark horse. To be continued. Um, guys, this week there's the national championships, individual time trial and road race. Um, here in Belgium, on Thursday, I think we have uh, the Remco Evenepoel against Wout van Aert show, against the clock. Um, 42 kilometers with 386 altitude meters along the way, which is pretty heavy. Who has the, the benefit? Judging of the past week, I would say that Remco does, uh, because Wout finished behind Remco in each of the stages. Of course, Remco is going for GC, uh, but yeah, Remco uh, Wout could go save himself a little bit more in the in the mountain stages and and really target those time trials. Uh, but on both occasions, finished behind Remco, so I think it's advantage Remco on that one. Agreed. Um, on Sunday, there's the road race in Isichem, uh, climbing Camelberg three times as well. Um, it's said to be a championship for sprinters, but of course you don't know. Uh, Wout van Aert said in a newspaper he, he really has his eyes on it, so he wants to make a hard race. Um, yeah, we really need to talk about one name. Uh, Dieter, you said something ex extremely weird. Um, Jules Hesters was your name. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is uncommon i think <laughs> could you please explain he looked very good in in zlm sprints and i think uh a, a, a race that's a bit tough not too tough like like the belgian championships are, are even better for him because he's he's a pretty strong boy he's not a pure sprinter so i think he uh 
it could be in for a surprise and and get a really good result or who knows maybe even a win out of nowhere. Bram, Eve, who's your name for Sunday? Merlich. I say Thibaut Nays. All possible. <laughs> it, it's a very difficult race to predict because um, of the stages, like the, the profile of the race. A few kilometers further than Isigheim, there is uh, the championship in France on uh, uh, Kasselberg, Mont Kassel. We have uh, Thibaut Pinot, Arnaud Demar. I don't know if he's starting. Uh, Julien Alaphilippe could be interesting as well there. Um, One thing for sure, Arnaud Demar is not going to ride for Group Alma, but he's going to ride for himself. <laughs> Certainly when he's not selected for the Tour. But maybe if Pinot gets that French national jersey, he's not quitting after this year. Yeah, interesting yeah I think they were thought. going up. Uh, they were going up. Mont de Cassel 32 times or something like that that's an insane course um so definitely something for climbers um like Pino so but maybe we'll see some to the French championships I imagine so yeah uh, he's like, French like every time every year the the FDG team at that race is like 20 riders 25 riders it's like insane um so yeah any other team winning French Championship is very impressive, and it's happened quite a few times in the past couple of years with uh, with Seneschal, for example. Romain Grigoire. Yeah, good pick. Interesting pick. Good one. But wouldn't FDG uh, or uh, Francis Eju, uh like ride for uh, Pinot just to like keep him in the in the team for another year? No, because the is gonna beat him at the finish line then. Oh, is he gonna anger a climb again? <laughs> He's gonna anger climb again. <laughs> One more question, guys. Who's going to keep Mathieu van der Poel from a new Dutch victory? No one. I don't think so. He it's, can only do it himself. It's in by a, riding in a very the championship dumb one. is in Limburg, I think. So that means um, a kind of Amstel Gold race terrain. Uh, if I'm right, I don't know, but it's certainly not flat. So that's a big advantage for him. For sure. Yeah. Um, there's one more topic we need to talk about before finishing this episode. That's uh, the 20th of August. Eve, what's on the 20th of August? The domestic social right. What is the domestic social right? It's a social right. It's in the name itself, of course. So we're not racing each other, except Dieter who wants to beat every domestic, but will not be able to. But the main thing about it is that we talk with others, with other participants, and just socialize a bit. Write the blue loop of the Ronde van Vlaanderen course, with the famous climbs like the Koppenberg, or the Quaremont, Paterberg, to end off in the centrum van Ronde van Vlaanderen, to have a drink, and to talk even more about cycling, about life, and about how I beat and did it in the final sprint. <laughs> All right. Um, how can people subscribe, um, register? Yeah, they can always subscribe to YouTube and Twitter, of course, but they can register uh, through the link in bio. Yeah, there is a, a link in a tweet and a link in bio. Um, we have a Strava group as well um, named Domestique. Um, where you can see how everyone is training for the ride um, and you can find the link to registrate as well there. So head over to that registration link, registration link and pre-register and you will receive a mail a couple of weeks before the event with the practical information. All right. What a way to end this episode. Bram, it's all yours. All right. Well, that's a wrap for today's Domestique Cycling Podcast. A big thank you to our audience for tuning in. If you enjoyed the podcast, consider supporting us on Ko-Fi or Twitter. And if you're on YouTube, hit subscribe and turn on notifications. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Ciao. I've got the sparse, the sickness. There's the twins in my
my brain.